Hello, good afternoon. I'm Hugh Dyer, Associate Director in RSK's GSI Business. Welcome to the March edition of our 2024 series of Down to Earth webinars. These talks cover a broad range of subjects through the year and we are available afterwards on our YouTube channel alongside previous talks. Our talk today will be given by Mark Perry from our LEAP Sustainable Soils team and he'll be talking to us about reuse of soils and waste minimization during redevelopment work. So firstly, a brief note on housekeeping during the talk. All attendees' microphones are automatically muted through the webinar. <clears throat> during the presentation, you can post questions online and there'll be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll get through as many questions as possible uh, after the presentation. Those that can't be answered due to time constraints will be answered after the webinar. Shortly after the webinar, you will receive a link to a short survey. If you could take a few minutes to provide feedback, please, so we can improve on future webinars, that'd be brilliant. So now let, let me please introduce our speaker today. Mark is a principal geoenvironmental engineer within the Kent office of Leaf Environmental, which is part of the RSK Geosites business. Mark is technical lead for sustainable soils and has over 20 years experience in the environmental site investigation and risk assessment sector, including 10 years at the Environment Agency. I'll hand over now to Mark to give us a run through of the reuse of soils and waste minimization. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to the webinar. Uh, as is tradition, Here's a bit of an introduction to what we're going to be talking about today. So sustainability, the what and the why, uh, what does source sustainability look like in terms of development? What should we be approaching and how should we get there? Uh, kind of briefly touch on benefits. Obviously that'll feel quite obvious at one level, but hopefully I can give you a couple of other thoughts on that. Have a look at material reuse, how we might implement some of these things about uh, materials management, how we consider different options for how we might reuse materials in different ways, and how we look at sustainability assessments. That might include things like uh, carbon calculators and different options that we might do in terms of options appraisal. The final part of the presentation is going to look on uh, some of the challenges. What's stopping us from achieving sustainability now, and how can we try and address those, some of those things? And the final element is to really look at a way forward, sort of my thoughts on how we could make some improvements on the situation, some easy wins, perhaps maybe some hard wins. So sustainability, the what and why. <clears throat> so it really comes down to three elements. There's net zero. The UK government has net zero ambitions, objectives, um, they change but we're talking about achieving net zero by 2050. Part of that is the carbon. How does carbon feature into our uh, net zero contribution? And then development. What does that contribute to it? That's the bit that we're involved in. So the UK government has an objective of identifying um, the key processes and building elements which will support the delivery of carbon neutral buildings. So carbon neutral being the objective, so what does that look like for us? Well, that could include things like how we heat our homes, how much renewable energy and um, renewable materials are used in the construction of the buildings. What about the data design and implement some of these building construction projects? But fundamentally, we're looking at the reducing the amount of embodied carbon within the construction. Let's really talk about soils though. We then could look at maybe the soil and stones report as produced by the Society for the Environment, um, where they talk about embodied carbon and carbon management associated with soils, where you could look at maybe minimising carbon losses through soil disturbance, so reducing that vegetation strip, cutting, and also how you can lock in or retain the locked in carbon within the soils by not disturbing them. Syria, within their document, also provides a an overview on, on the processes and approaches and the methods to actually design out the generation waste from construction. 
So again, we're looking at different angles of sustainability, all of the things that then feature into the overall net zero objectives. Ultimately, any excavation, reuse or disposal of materials are going to contribute to the embodied carbon of the development. So what could it look like? You could argue that no excavation or a development with no waste that's generated would be the most sustainable, but it's not really going to happen. You really do need to excavate source to have a development of any real size. So what we've got to look at is maybe minimising the amount of excavation required. Do we need to have those foundations quite as deep? Do we look at an alternative um, development method, construction method? What about maximising the reuse of materials? If we are uh, excavating material, we can try and reuse that material either on site or an adjacent nearby site. That would be a good approach. And ultimately, if we can minimise the amount of waste that ends up at landfill, that would be a massive success. All of those three things together would are general approaches to achieving sustainability, particularly from the respect of soils. It does, though, require planning. It requires planning of the development at an early stage. So how much material is going to be, uh, uh, sorry, the layout of our development, site levels, foundation design, they're all elements that play into that construction and that, that um, development design. If we can reduce the amount of material that's generated through our foundations, maybe reuse some of that material within a slightly tweaked or amended site layout or site levels, we're actually incorporating that material back into the site as far as possible. Also, the materials that we do generate, we've got to protect, we've got to ensure that they're not lost or inadvertently become waste. So looking at the waste hierarchy on the right-hand side, we really want to be at the top end of that pyramid. We want to be the prevention, the minimise. What we don't want to be is at the bottom end. We don't want to be sending materials off for disposal. So the benefits of sustainability. Well, ultimately, we're going to be talking about a cost reduction, but that's not as simple as it may seem. That's a cost reduction from excavation. The less we're excavating, it's going to be cost efficient. We're not going to be costing as much to generate that material in the first instance. We haven't got to handle as much material. And then if we end up with waste at the end of it, we haven't got to dispose of that material or send it off site to other sites to be reused. They're all elements of cost. Directly linked to that is a carbon reduction. Every time that you're excavating, you're generating material and you're using a, an excavator or a dumper to move that material. So there's a carbon implication for that. Even if you send it off site, it's going off by um, a haulier who's going to take it to a landfill site. That landfill is then going to have um, carbon dioxide emitted from it from just a degradation of the material. There's also an efficiency. If you reduce the amount of material you're excavating in the first instance, reduce the amount of material you've got to handle, that development's going to go forward a bit quicker. It's going to be more efficient. There will be a cost saving. So they're all interlinked. Ultimately, if you can limit the amount of material that is needs to be managed, that's got to be an approach towards sustainability. So how do we do material reuse or material management? Well, the obvious answer is through um, mechanisms like Dow COP, materials management plans, waste exemptions, environmental permits. Yes. However, they're just the, the legal mechanisms in which we employ it. They don't actually dictate how things are uh, implemented sustainably. For that, we need to consider the planning of the development. How much, what is the material need for each of those sites? So it's fundamentally, how much material, what type, when is it going to be needed, when is it going to be generated, and where can it be reused? So we can cut back to individual sites and their cut field balances. An ideal situation would be that development would be completely balanced. It would be cut field neutral so that the amount of material that is generated is reused on that site. There's no surplus. There's no waste generated. It's commonplace now across um, developers that they'll, larger developers that will take a strategic view. They'll look across a range of development sites. They'll have a number on the go at any one time and they'll have a few that are in the pipeline. 
developed out over a number of years. And what they'll look to do is balance the soil demands, and how much is generated across a range of those developments. You really need to think about where those sites are located and at what time that material is going to be generated and needed. Sites can be located very close to each other, but actually 18 months between one site completing and another one commencing, or that they may be running simultaneously, but actually very large distances apart. That doesn't help with the sustainability or the reuse of materials. What about the smaller developers, those that only build out one development site a year? How do they manage that? Well, as with everyone, there is the Clare Materials Register. There's other commercial companies that are applying, providing a similar service. Local hauliers as well, great source of information. They're already linked in with the developers and the ground workers, so they'll understand where the material is going to be generated and where they're needed. And also there's consultants like ourselves. They'll know where the materials are going to be generated, they'll know the opportunities and the issues with each site, the demands and when they're going to be needed. So in terms of making it work, we need to understand more about the soils and what's available from when. So back to cut fill volumes, is there a good idea of where the material is going to be generated, how much, what type of material? We're going to look for the opportunities and limitations. There may be material that's being generated, but are there constraints to its reuse? That might be subsoils that are not geotechnically suitable for reuse as a structural film. But could they be improved? What about the topsoil? The topsoil might be really good quality but has a high stone content, meaning that it's not suitable for use in a private garden, but might be really useful within a POS area or around swales. Do they need to be treated? Do they need to be improved? So we need to understand soil characterization. We might need some more information for that. All of that feeds into the viability. Can we reuse this material? Are there better options? What information might we, we need to actually make that informed decision? Ultimately, we're gonna to have to communicate that really effectively, not only to our clients, but also the ground workers. If the site has several different types of topsoil across it, for instance, a topsoil in part of the site that is really good quality, doesn't need anything doing to it, can be reused directly within the private garden, that needs to be really well highlighted. If that's next to us, a topsoil on the same site, that actually needs some improvement to it. Maybe it's texturally not brilliant. And the third element of topsoil that has made ground within, you don't want those three topsoils all mixed together. You want to keep them separate. So how do you communicate that to the ground workers so that they don't actually inadvertently create a big pile of made ground? So carbon calculators, haulage costs and maps. These are all elements that you might use to make a decision as to which site you send material to, how you reuse that material. It's all about options appraisal, and options assessment. So what soils are being generated? Where are they needed? Where are those sites? They're both spatial elements. We can look at those on the plan. And when is it happening? Time frame is really important. Are the sites happening concurrently or are they, is there going to be a gap between them? Again, it's just making sure that we understand that. We can do some calculations around it in terms of haulage costs, for example. If it's on paper going to cost more to send material from site A to site B, what about site C? Carbon calculators can also play a part in that assessment process. They allow you to compare between different options but considering the carbon component, not the time and not the distance, not the retinue distance anyway. Ultimately, it will show that some opportunities are better than others, about understanding how much better or how much worse. So in terms of carbon calculators, most people are kind of familiar with what they do, maybe you've used one, maybe you've seen some of the outputs from them. Essentially, they are a mechanism of allowing you to compare different engineering or reuse or remediation options. I've seen one that considers different farming activities, but that's another matter. Within LEAP, we've developed credit. Credit is carbon reduction digital twin. It allows us to consider 
between different options for either materials management plans, foundations, remediation design, and even earthworks, just allows us to compare between options. So for an instance of foundations, that might be a comparison between a traditional strip footing versus a pile design. And you can look at the different diameters of the different depths of those to find out where you want to sit. It allows the comparison between the options. It has a limitation. It's limited to the amount of information you're able to put into it, the accuracy of that information from the get-go. So for instance, if your fill plan is a little bit off, that's an uncertainty. It's a, it's a vagueness that you need to address. It needs to be considered and, and understood within the reassessment. Equally, it might be that you've got um, too much material and you don't understand the quality of it. So that's a big uncertainty within your model. It can be refined. Importantly, they only assess the options between, um, the, the differences between different options. They're not an, a risk assessment in themselves. That sits outside of it. So if it's comparing one foundation type against another, that's done within the, the, the geotechnical report, or the same for the environmental side of things. So having a quick look at the output for um, something from credit. So this is um, a quick table that uh, produces, a graph that produces the percentage total of carbon dioxide emissions equivalent against the worst case scenario, worst case being option one. In this instance, we're assuming all the surplus landfill, uh, all the surplus soils that are generated, topsoil in this instance, is excavated and sent to landfill. We then return to site with virgin imported material. So that's the worst of the worst. You can see that landfilling it equates to just over 50%. We then compare against different options. We start to look at different variances of how much material was, are reused. It doesn't directly show you volumes, this is a percentage. So actually it's just a reduction of carbon. So option two, you can see that there is a, an encrypting um, a reuse of material on site. And that has significantly reduced the amount of carbon dioxide that's emitted because of reusing that material rather than having to import it. And options three, well, we're not bringing in any virgin material, we're just simply reusing material either on site or off site. Options four and five show further reductions. In these instances, no landfilling is occurring, it's all reused. We look at the subsoils. By the way, these are all site specific information, so they will vary, they're not generic. Again, a similar thing, we're comparing option one, all the material that surplus is landfilled and then we're importing virgin material to make up. The amount of carbon dioxide equivalent that um, forms option one is lower than the topsoil. And that's because it relates to the amount of organic carbon that's in that material. Subsoils will have a lower proportion of it. So that's why it appears lower. But we've got a higher transport. Material needs to be brought in still. We can see that compared to the topsoil, there's less of a variance between options three, four, and five, but it just shows that compared particularly with option two with reusing material on site. It's also important to remember, reiterate, that it doesn't account for the volume of material, it's just about the carbon, the percentage of carbon. So on a topsoil site, a site with topsoil, the proportion of topsoil, the volume of topsoil, might be quite a lot lower than the subsoils. So what do we do with this? Well, you can assess the material options. You can look at it in different metrics, distances from site, you can color code it, you can do really impressive stuff with it. You can look at the timings of things, and you can look at perhaps the viability, how much effort needs to go into this material. You can, ass you can assess that in a number of ways. Ultimately, we've got to identify those options and opportunities that are most favourable, but also compare that against the, those that are least favourable. We'll need to highlight any limitations and also any uncertainties. That might be the quality of the material, the thickness of it, treatability. That's it. Would it, would it work in stabilisation or is it, is it never going to be suitable material? We're going to go through a process of refinement and updates. 
And that's because it's always a live document. These things are always changing. That could be a case of the number of sites that are going to be included in the strategy change. It could be that the phasing has changed or that there's a slowdown in when material is going to be produced. Or maybe the material actually doesn't treat very well. And ultimately, we're going to implement it. At the end of that, what is really, really important is a review against the predictions. Did we achieve what we set out to, to achieve? At the start, we will have had volumes of materials of topsoil, subsoil, any other materials that are going to be generated, and a waste quantity. What did we actually hit? How much material was reused? Where was it reused? And how much went off site as waste? And that can be volume and that can be cost. Really important at the end of it that we compare, that we check to see how we set up against. Did we achieve what we set out to do? Or did we generate too much material? Too much waste. From there, you can do that assessment, that back check to see, well, where could we be better? What went wrong? It's really important because that allows us to understand, well, actually, maybe it's materials handling we went awry, or perhaps it was we had to overdig because of the ground conditions. There's some lessons there. So, the final part of the presentation really looks at the challenges. I think there's two, I think there's two key challenges, regulation and the current industry thinking. Dowcot works really well, I think, broadly. It's a tool that's been around for a good few years. There's a really good awareness of it, although it could always be better. How it's being implemented, yes, always could be improved, but still the fact that it's being asked for is brilliant. There's definitely been an uptick over the past few years definitely more and more inquiries about MMPs and reuse of material. So just setting out from the outset of that reuse, potential reuse of material, surpluses and deficits to get those plans in place. So I think we're in a good position. What would our COP3 version look like? I don't know. I do have some concerns, mainly because it's uncertain, but I think as long as it's still there, as long as there's a mechanism still there, I think we should, as an industry, grab hold of it and use it and make the most of it. In terms of topsoil, I'd like to see topsoil being considered as a resource rather than a potential waste, much in the same way that clays, gravels and sands under minerals are considered as a resource and not as a potential waste immediately. The same should be true with topsoil. Topsoil is a valuable resource. Whilst it's not a huge quantity that may fall foul of the waste regs. Actually, just to make sure that the opportunity is there, back to the carbon calculator, it's a really important thing to remember and to take an advantage of. Obviously, where that material becomes mixed, cross contaminated, generally contaminated, it's definitely a waste and should be removed from the material stream. Probably the big one for me is site practices. And I'm really apologetic over this, but there's all my photos have been of appalling instances of waste of material management. That's because I've really struggled to find some really good examples. I think most, like most consultants, we go out to site and we take photos of the really bad things rather than focus on the good things. But I think it does underline that actually ground workers and sites could work better. So that not stripping the topsoil on day one, not deliberately taking all that material off, putting it in the stock part and leaving it there. Firstly, potentially end, uh, ends up as waste for a couple of reasons, either no MMP or the fact that it's stopped part for too long. Also, do you need to do that? It's going to degrade in quality over time, so we don't really want that. Also, materials handling, poor handling, stockpiling, housekeeping, preventing materials from becoming cross-contaminated and mixed. That's a really bad thing. We want to make sure that things are kept separate so that that resource is retained. Ultimately, we need to be making sure that there's a planning element to what we're doing rather than reacting. The number of times that I've had phone calls on a Friday, I've got this big waste bill. How can I reduce it? How can I reuse this material? Kind of that option is gone. The planning implementation of a net materials management plan has gone. You can't retrospectively apply it. So I'd rather see that there is a real consideration of material 
its value and how it could be reused or minimise the generation of material from the outset has got to be the right approach rather than actually having to deal with a problem at the end. So for what it's worth, my way forwards, um, something achieving sustainability would be a development that's designed to cause the least impact, that generates the least amount of material. So we have to handle the least amount of material. Through that, we generate the least amount of waste. We don't have to then send it off the landfill. And that waste is not generated through poor handling of materials or the fact that it wasn't um, excavated under a materials management plan. That the development uses the least amount of energy. So that's the excavator running all day because it's got to excavate huge amounts of material because we haven't planned our foundations properly. Dumpers that are associated with that to moving material around the site or lorries taking source to landfills. All of this comes back to the releasing the least amount of carbon. They all influence that carbon cost at the end of it, the embodied carbon within the development. Also, better soil management. Let's limit the amount of excavation that's needed. Let's reduce the amount of soil stripping that happens, particularly on week one. That could be a case of actually protecting the topsoil that's there, so it doesn't need to be excavated ever. What, what about akin to a, a root protection zone, what about a soil protection zone? That there's a barrier to prevent um, excavation when not needed, fracking across it, or even stop piling materials on top of it. Just stop that from ever happening. Also, good stockpile management and materials management. So where we do generate soils, it's kept as a resource and not becomes a muddled mess that ends up as waste. And that is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Oh, our camera's back on. Should Thank be. you, Mark. That was an excellent talk. <laughs> really interesting to learn more about this. Um, we've got a number of questions which are coming in on the portal, and people can keep submitting questions if they want things, if they uh, have more pressing questions as we go through. Um, firstly, how practical is it to undertake processing of soils to improve these on site, say for high moisture content material, and how sustainable is this? Well, good question. Um, I think it's understand that they're all going to be very site specific. That's that's the key bit. I would probably challenge to say, well, do you need to manage that material? Do you need to treat it? Obviously, the answer is yes. It's actually assessing that um, that treatment option. If it's a case of setting the soils to one side and drying or series of processes it's just understanding how you can minimize how much needs to be so is that a case of reducing how much is excavated it really comes back to planning actually i would couch that against what's your alternative do you landfill that material because that's the only option available to you because that's going to be infinitely worse than actually trying to treat it the only challenge to that is actually making sure if you're treating it on site that you retain the soil structure. That will be tricky so that the soil soil still performs in the way that it, was in, it should do. But that's back to materials handling. So quite a challenge, actually. OK, interesting. Um, the next question, I suppose, related to that. How easy is it to mix materials on site to improve soil properties? I suppose that's under the MMP. Not strict, I mean, possibly might fall under an MMP. And I suppose it depends on what type of soils as well. So if you're talking about a geotechnical improvement, that could be a dantelime stabilization as one option. Um, if it's a topsoil, there are um, abilities to blend soils together. And if it's a case of improving, say, the organic content or the nu nutrient levels, Actually, that might not be done as a big stockpile exercise. That might be done as it's being placed. So actually, does it need to be uh, on mass almost as a big process activity, or is it small 
small scale within gardens. So I'd look very carefully about how it needs to be implemented. What's the fundamental issue with the soil? What needs to be improved? How does it, uh, how will it need to be implemented? But I would seek the uh, advice of a specialist who, who understands how to process that. So you can look at the different options as well, not just looking to blend the two together. Okay, excellent. Um, again, related, can you separate an unsuitable soil to remove the unsuitable element? And the example they've given is asbestos cement pieces from a soil, and then how cost effective would this be? Oh, now that's the specific example, which is good to answer, but probably not the answer you want. It is doable, it's very expensive, and there's no guarantee that it'll work in my experience, but that's a remediation technique rather than a, a reuse of soils specifically. Um, so just sort of setting aside the implications for waste and physically pick asbestos cement fragments. Uh, it's labour intensive, there's no guarantee that it'll be 100% successful and it will need lots of verification, inspection work afterwards, so you may not like the outcome of it. But actually, in the principle of reducing your waste, it should be the approach that you're undertaking anyway. You should, under WM3, be trying to follow, um, the, the classification of the waste of the material that's being generated as a waste. So in that instance, if you can remove the hazardous fragments of asbestos from the non-hazardous topsoil, that's exactly the approach you should be doing. How successful? Well, it's down to the material type. Okay, excellent. Um, I think this is a wish, really. Is there a publicly available map showing location of topsoil source sites and receptor sites? Uh, it's a really good wish. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the closest that you can get to that at the moment that's freely available is the Clare uh, Materials Register. It's on the Clare website. Clare administered the DALCOP, um, so materials management. Um, and they hold a list. You can register your site with that particular um, materials register itself. So you can highlight, I have a need for this material or I have surplus of this material. You can then provide details. Equally, you can freely look at that list. You have to pick off the, um, the reference code and ask Claire for the details. I believe it's in an update and there are changes afoot with it, but as a process that's there. There are companies that are offering that same service and without being too dismissive of them, it's whether they genuinely have the, that material available to them, and whether it's covered by a materials management plan, so it could be genuinely reused. My experience with what I've seen so far is not necessarily aligned fully within the Claire approach, but certainly giving a an appearance of more sites that are available, more sources of material that are available, but whether they're actually there, I don't know. Okay, and probably a follow-up to that is, are you able to stockpile materials on site, so say topsoil, that then you can then in future use under an MMP? If you generate the material within an MMP, so MMP comes is a broad term for the process of materials management, where it's reused, that MMP is then declared to Claire. If you excavate the material with the intention, it's demonstrating the intention to reuse rather than discard, which is the waste test, then provided you have cut field drawings, or at least an idea that there is materials that's going to be surplus, that you're going to generate and it's going to be reused. Just documenting that is actually the bare bones of an MMP. So if you're going to generate some material, you're going to stockpile it and reuse it on site later, then following the MMP approach would be really, really good. Maybe not be fully necessary, but there is a limit in terms of how long you can stockpile it for, and it's 12 months, and that's the Environment Agency. So after which time the Environment Agency may consider that it to be a waste because it's not been reused, there's no demonstrable reuse. You can ask them nicely if they can extend that, but um, there's no guarantee. They generally should say yes. 
but I go back to that documentation from the outset. We need this material. We're going to stockpile it here. We're going to look after it and we're going to reuse it. Excellent. Um, is there a general rule of thumb regarding distance for transport soils under Dow Cop or an MMP, either in guidance or in practicality? As far as I'm aware, there is no limitation for how far you might want to take the material. It's just going to be how much it costs. And obviously, from today's talk as well, about sustainability. How sustainable is it to haul material hundreds of miles or 50 miles? And that's actually part of the assessment work that we've been implementing within our work is to look at distances as cutoffs. So it might be a case of looking within 10, 10 kilometres of the site versus 20 kilometres versus 30 to 40 to 50. So you can see that carbon impact and also cost if you want to look at it. So haulier will give you a cost for moving that material. So sometimes there may be a need, a specific need to move things further. But actually, it would be ideal to keep the material and reuse it as close to the site as possible. That would be the most sustainable out outcome. OK. Um, how do we work with ground workers to improve their awareness and work with them on the movement and management of the materials in their practices? That's a can of worms, thanks. Um, <laughs> I. It's one that I'm still trying to wrestle with. I, I am approached as a consultant by both the developer and also the ground worker. I think it's education all the way through, um, and I do offer this so from the advertising, what I'm doing anyway, is to actually provide CPD training to both the technical teams within the developers, but also offer that to the site management, so the site teams, and also if wanted to the ground workers. Obviously, depending on the size of the ground worker will depend on their level of knowledge and their own obligations, what they want to achieve. It is a genuine challenge to try and get ground workers to understand all the all the things that they need to do together with things like contamination, environmental protection, so silt management, dust management, through to what's legal under reuse of materials, uh, waste regulations and materials management plans. Which we're coming back to the, the concept of the communications. Um, I will tend to produce plans, say for the topsoil, for example. Um, it's one page. It's a one page document that's visual. Saws over here, excavate, store there. Saws over here, they're going off site. And it's just as simple as that. Obviously, we need to tailor it to each development. We need those discussions. Hopefully, we're speaking to the lead groundwork and we can have that. But no, that's acceptable, that's not acceptable. I think what's really good is to have some really good, I don't go on site anymore, but to have some really good engineers who are attending site and having those dialogue, I think it's really important. They're able to spot things, highlight it, flag it early, and hopefully correct it before it becomes a big problem. The challenge is getting people to listen to you in the first instance. Right, I think we'll have one final question, then we'll. We'll end the session then. Are there occasions, it's a good one, where the most sustainable option is to remove materials to landfill and replace with suitable soils rather than use high energy or low sustainability treatment methods? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to come down to, I, 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 to unpick that a little bit more because I think that's a really good question is that Inherently, there are going to be sites where you, know, you don't, we either we can't do it for. Um, if you took the Surf UK approach, so social, economic, and environmental considerations, and apply that to this situation, that's probably where you'd need to look. So, is there a need to get the development moved quickly for a social reason because of the disturbance, or there's a, an outright need for the housing now? That's that's one consideration. Is it financially better? Maybe, maybe not. But again, it's it's a consideration. At least you factored it. And environmental. Well, I'd probably say it's probably least environmentally friendly. But until you run the assessment using, say, a credit carbon calculator to actually understand well, what are the implications of all of these options, you wouldn't actually be able to then 
um, but a, a number of instances to actually genuinely assess it. If it feels like it's unsustainable, but actually demonstrate it to be not as bad, well, that gives you quite a good case to say, well, maybe it's the right thing to do, considering again, back to that Surf UK model. Some sites genuinely are either tight for space and there are genuine needs, or it's genuinely really, really complicated, difficult to treat, process, segregate the material or to handle it. So there may be really, really good instances where you might want to haul the material off site. Equally, if you can send that material, if it's good quality, and send it to another development site, so it's reused, that has got to be the next best thing, I would say, rather than retaining it on site. There are some instances where I've seen that general approach. Uh, one instance is a slight aside is that perhaps the development is going to be cut fill balance or actually at the end of it might need material, might generate material. But either way, it's got its own cut fill assessment. But to get that development underway, maybe some enabling works, a road connection, something like that, to get those construction platforms up perhaps, that you need to import material from the outset. That would be one consideration, knowing that the rest of the development would then generate materials that would be surplus. So again, it's just thinking about that whole life cycle of the development and how those material needs come in and out. And just think about that sustainably to try and get the best solution. I hope that's answered the question because it's a really good one. No, that, that, that was very good, yes. So we'll end the questions there. Thank you ever so much, Mark. Any further questions will be answered once Mark has had a chance to review them. And our next Down to Earth talk will be on Tuesday, the 9th of April, providing a guide to using the correct geophysics techniques. This will be the second in our geophysics um, series of talks. Please remember to complete the feedback following the presentation. And thank you for attending today. And thank you again to Mark for his talk. And we'll see you again in April.